So uh, I imagine most of you have had a chance to learn a little bit about Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrency and the things that are happening around the world. We've had some wonderful panels here. Uh, anyone catch the Noriel Rabini, Joe Lubin, and Mike Novogratz conversation? That must have been an interesting one. This is live stream, so I think everyone can go back and catch that. Uh, so let me see, where do we want to talk? Where do we want to start? The industry is 10 years old. And like the internet, as it was being developed in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the internet really didn't hit its groove until the mid-90s when the browser was created because you needed a sufficient amount of bridges, roads, and tunnels. You needed infrastructure before this was able to go mainstream, before consumers were able to access it. And so these last 10 years have really been about developing the underlying infrastructure to make these tools available to the masses. And so the question is, where are we in that process? Is this 1985, 1990, 1995? I'm of the opinion that this is our Netscape moment. We now have the infrastructure to launch scalable applications, decentralized applications on blockchain. And the things that we needed for that to happen is we needed blockchains that were scalable, you know, able to handle large user bases, we needed really fast blockchains that were low latency. The average person doesn't want to run on something that's slow just because it's decentralized. That's not the thing that motivates them. And we needed something with little to no friction. And we now have blockchains that have no fees. And so at this point, you can build just about anything on a blockchain that you can build on the traditional internet. It's my belief that what's happening here is going to be substantially larger than the internet that we use today. We're effectively building the new internet. And the future of the internet is in distributed applications, not just things like cryptocurrency. And so for those of you that don't know what a blockchain is, think of the blockchain as the operating system. If you use an Apple phone, think of that as like the Apple operating system or iOS. And think of things like Bitcoin as the first application. And we are now just at the very beginning of seeing what this type of technology can do. And the things that I think are going to be biggest, the things that are going to drive mass adoption in the near term now that we can build these big scalable applications are going to be the same things that we use in the existing internet. It's going to be things like new social networks. You can now build Facebook using a blockchain, but where we, the end users, own all of our data. We control who has access to that data. We give permission or we have to give our consent essentially for advertisers to access our data. And we might even be the beneficiary of any remuneration that occurs. Imagine a world in which you, the user, receive all of the revenues that are generated from your data and being aware of who has access to it. Is that something that you'd be interested in using? I think that most of us are. So I think that that's going to be a big, exciting thing to pay attention to. And I think over the course of the next year, we're going to see you know, the, the battle between the centralized social networks begin versus the decentralized networks that are fighting for privacy and consent and user participation in the revenues that are generated. Another example are going to be the things we use today. Messaging, for example. Right now, some of us are concerned about privacy yet again. Is your Signal application, your Telegram application, your WhatsApp application, your Skype, are those things secure? Do you know? No, you don't. You have to trust that those systems are doing what they tell you they're doing. Because of blockchain, because of the security layer that it enables, you can now build provably secure messaging systems where the company can't even access your data. Obviously, gaming is another exciting potential use case. Gaming has driven a lot of the technology sort of that we use today. Um, I'm one of the uh, uh, early contributors or uh, uh, founders of Block One where EOS was created. Uh, EOS sold $4.1 billion worth of tokens in their crowd sale, making them the largest capital markets transaction or IPO-like transaction of last year. We took a billion dollars of that 4.1 and created a program called EOS VC, 
to invest in companies or applications being built on top of that blockchain. Of the capital that's been deployed, about 50% of that has been into gaming applications. So I'm very excited about the decentralized games that you're going to be seeing over the course of the next year. So I think we are at that Netscape moment. And it's taken us 10 years to get to that point. So I'm very, very bullish on, call it, decentralized applications. So where are we at from a market's perspective? The crypto market's aggregate market cap today is $188 billion as of a few minutes ago. In late 2017, we got close to the trillion dollar mark. And so we've gone from that bull market down into a bear market, not the first time, and we keep going through these cycles. I'm actually a big fan of when the crypto markets are down because it essentially purges the industry of a lot of the riffraff. It cleans out the players that are not building you know, the things that are going to be here for the long term, the people that are preying upon the uninformed because of it, the lack, we call it the asymmetry of information that exists here. But I'm very, very bullish. I never get into the business of making price predictions because it's very difficult to predict when the market is going to have, you know, when the market's going to move. But right now, I said that crypto winter is over, spring has come early, and I've been seeing groundhogs everywhere. And I'll give you one specific insider data point that leads me to believe this. Cambridge Associates, not to be confused with Cambridge Analytics, is an organization that recommends asset allocations for major institutions, pensions, endowments, major insurance companies. And about two months ago, Cambridge Associates suggested that institutions allocate about 30 basis points of their portfolio to like cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Cambridge Associates is perhaps the closest thing to the word of God to these institutions. A lot of institutions, the employees there get bonused based, of, based upon hitting the allocations recommended by Cambridge Associates, which means we're about to see the opening of the floodgates, probably about $300 billion of capital coming into the industry. It'll take some time, but that's one of the most significant things that ha has happened in our industry and leads me to believe that we're looking at a very bull market, both in terms of the applications that can be developed, and now it's been greenlit for major institutions to come in. We've only had 10 or 20, you know, the Harvard Endowment, for example, you know, Yale, only some of the smartest institutions have been allocating capital to this space, the Goldman Sachs's of the world. But now we're going to the fidelities. Now we're going to start to see the rest of the world's major institutions allocating capital to this space. So I'm very excited about it. And an interesting data point that's lost on most people is we start thinking about these numbers, 188 billion. Where are we at in terms of the markets? Think about like the Internet 1.0 or the dot-com boom. In the dot-com boom, tech stocks got to the point of having an aggregate market cap of $6.7 trillion. $6.7 trillion when this was an entirely Western phenomenon. And that number is not inflation adjusted. Imagine when you're dealing with a global phenomenon and inflation adjusted dollars, I think I could make a compelling argument it was more like 50 trillion. This industry is at 188 billion which means we haven't even seen the beginning of the big bull run. We haven't seen the beginning of the big wave. I think this is a much bigger technology that's going to have a much bigger impact on the world than the Internet had. You know, the Internet of Information. This is now the Internet of Value, the Internet of Everything, the Internet of Security. We're upgrading the Internet. I think that this is going to be five or ten times larger than the Internet of Information, which was really just enabling, call it communication or data to flow. Now that we're able to secure the Internet, we can start to use financial systems and all sorts of things on top of, call it this new internet. Which means, if you're like, oh, did I miss the crypto wave? Have I, has, you know, have I missed the boat? It's still early. You know, we're back at, we're, we're in that 1996, 1997 moment right now. We haven't even seen the beginning of the first big wave. So I think that's worth noting. A couple of other things to touch on. Things that are going to be driving a lot of adoption in this space. I'm a big fan of security tokens. The idea that we can start to securitize all of the world's major assets as we start to see things like stocks and bonds and real estate put on a blockchain, I think that's going to also drive a lot of growth in this space. You know, it's my belief that eventually all stocks are going to trade on this technology. Th take, for example, the world's stock markets today. They run from 9 to 5 on weekdays. 
they're local by nature, and they run on very slow, inefficient, insecure technology. We can now build global markets that run 24 by 7 using the most secure, efficient technologies the world has ever seen. When you're looking at that sort of comparable, in my view, the future that I'm describing is inevitable. Very excited about that. I also think that in the world of security tokens, the thing that excites me most in terms of what's going what's to come first um, are not going to be the things like I just discussed there because there's already a market for those things. Meaning it might be better, but it's not an order of magnitude better than the existing systems today. If you want to see something get mass adoption in a very, very short period of time, you need to be improving things by an order of magnitude. Meaning you need to be delivering products that do not exist otherwise. You know, the leading payment in the mar mar uh, market in the world, for example, is Kenya where 70% of all transactions are conducted using a mobile phone, using a digital currency, which is a prepaid cell phone minute, you wouldn't think that Kenya would be the leading payment market in the world. The reason why is because they didn't have any alternative payment system. When there's nothing else there, the new system is the thing that gets the traction. Most of us still pull out a credit card versus, versus using our phone here in the US to pay for things, because it's very hard to change human behavior. And so the market for security tokens that I'm most excited about is intellectual property related to entertainment. Think movies, for example. There's a lot of people that are a fan of things like Iron Man. But if you're a big fan of those projects, there's no way for you to own a piece of it. And using things like the Jobs Act today, you can take a movie project, take it public using a Reg A offering while it's in pre-production, allow millions of fans to participate, and those stocks in those projects can trade. And so these are the sorts of things that I expect we'll see over the course of the next year, which will help drive the security token market. Um, it's probably also worth talking about what was mentioned before. I moved to Puerto Rico uh, immediately following Hurricane Maria. I noticed because of all the things that I've done in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space, wherever I went in the world, interesting people would show up. And so as I was becoming a bit of a nexus, I started thinking about the responsibility of that. If people will go wherever I go, people with intellectual capital, people with financial capital, what kind of social experiment could I conduct that might have a positive impact in the world? I measure my success by the positive impact I have in the world, not the financial success that I have. That's the way that I measure my success. And so it's like, well, I could be in New York, San Francisco, London, but those places don't really benefit from, you know, interesting people showing up. They're already crushing it. And I thought about where in the world could I go that would benefit from lots of interesting people showing up. And after Hurricane Maria, it became very clear that Puerto Rico was an interesting place for it. You know, Puerto Rico, I like to argue, was the first state that's not the 51st state, but in some ways the forgotten state. And so I wanted to see how I could help. And the early sort of progress that we've made there is rather amazing. It, over a thousand people have moved. Puerto Rico is now considered to be one of the leading blockchain hubs in the world. And that's because of this thing called Act 20 and Act 22. Most people don't know this, but the Act 22 decree allows you as a US citizen, being a resident in Puerto Rico, you pay no federal income tax. You're not, you're not skipping state tax like in Florida or Texas. You pay no federal taxes, zero capital gains and a 4% ordinary income tax. And so a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space that have done very well have said, wow, that's interesting, because it's one of the only places in the world where a US citizen can live and pay no capital gains. And so Puerto Rico, as a result of those great incentives, has attracted a lot of the best and the brightest. And the main thing that Puerto Rico has been suffering from is a consistent brain drain. You know, there were three and a half million people living in Puerto Rico prior to Hurricane Maria. And immediately following the hurricane, about a half a million people left. And the people that left are the ones with the means to leave. Those with the intellectual capital and the financial capital. And how do you combat a brain drain with a brain gain? And so a lot of interesting things we've started to see happen there. It's not just become a blockchain hub. You're starting to see the emergence of a real startup ecosystem. You know, lots of angels have shown up. Angel investors, that is. Lots of mentors that have been there and done that. And they're helping the Puerto Rican entrepreneurs that have a dream, helping to see those dreams potentially become a reality. 
And Puerto Rico's got talent. They have the number 15 engineering school in the United States. You have more bachelor degrees there per capita than anywhere in the US. You have more artists there per capita than anywhere in the US. So there's not a lack of talent. There's a lack of opportunity. Most Puerto Ricans have to leave because there just isn't any opportunity there. And that's why they end up in San Francisco and they end up in New York. And now with the emergence of this startup culture, Puerto Rican entrepreneurs, Puerto Rican engineers that are working in these wonderful companies that didn't want to leave now have an opportunity to come back and start to do you know, things entrepreneurially. So that's super exciting. I'm also very interested in what's happening there from an agricultural perspective. Over 85% of the food in Puerto Rico is imported. They have four growing seasons. There's rainforests, so incredible soil and potential to grow things. And they only have about two to three weeks of food. So there's a food security and a food resilience, pr resilience, uh, resiliency problem there. And so it's something that I'm very excited about. And uh, I, you know, outside of blockchain, it seems like the other main theme at this conference <laughs> this year is special opportunity zones. 96% of Puerto Rico is an opportunity zone. It's an opportunity zone that is also a luxury destination. And so super exciting place to be making investments related to opportunity zones, things like agriculture. Another thing that's worth noting there is uh, the governor just passed legislation to make Puerto Rico the most important part of the United States when it comes to clean energy. And so anybody that's working on things related to clean energy should be focused on Puerto Rico because there's a major, major mandate to roll things out quickly. And there's the potential to make Puerto Rico the leading hub in the US for this, to create smart grids so that you're not relying upon a centralized energy grid where if one thing goes wrong, the entire system goes down. But to create a smart grid where if some part of the island loses access to its power, the rest of the island still functions. And this is something that we're going to need across the United States. These central points of failure are a major issue that hopefully we can begin to resolve. And so hopefully I've given you a little bit of insight into what's going on in the cryptocurrency space and blockchain. I couldn't be more bullish. I think we're looking, we're in crypto spring right now and summer is coming. Uh, we're out of the winter and we're gonna see massive things happening. If you haven't been down to Puerto Rico, it's become a major hub for the blockchain community. Uh, very interesting incentives. And if you've got capital gains and you're looking at opportunity zones, I think the most interesting investments that are going to be happening in the US are likely there. So um, thank you for listening. Enjoy the, uh, the concert tonight. Glad to close out Salt.